First of all, let me thank the organizer, Angela, Monica and Miles for organizing this wonderful event, which uh, really cheers us up, I think, in this hard COVID times. And uh, well, of course, for giving me the opportunity to give a lecture is my first uh, online seminar. So I don't know how it will go. I hope uh, you will enjoy it. What I'm going to talk about today is about sharp extinction rates for fast diffusion equation on generic bounded domains, which is a joint work with uh, Alessio Figalli, which is, um, uh, I hope, looking at this talk. And, um, and uh, I, will, uh, I will explain you in one second all uh, the, what, which is the problem, a, br a brief history. So let me start with uh, the main, uh, the structure of the talk. So I will do a brief introduction, I present the problem, and then I will link it to the two better known cases, which are the heat equation and the porous medium equation. And then we will see the result, and then we will see how the linearized problem works, and then I will uh, present you the um, non -linear, new nonlinear entropy method that we have de developed. And let's say this part is uh, introduction and main result, and this part will be a sketch of the proof. Okay, in the end, there will be the references, at least of the main contribution in this uh, in this problem. So, let me start by presenting the um, by presenting the the problem. So, uh, we will deal with the Dirichlet problem for a fast diffusion equation on a smooth bounded domain of R n. Hmm? A smooth say C2 alpha at least. Okay. During the talk, I will give more example of admissible or non-admissible domains. So you start with the standard degenerate uh, or singular porous medium type equation, which has this form. If you expand a bit the, the gradient, you get this. This is a degenerate, uh, this is a degenerate parabolic equation because the generator singular because you see the diffusion coefficient u to the m minus one if m is bigger than one then is zero when u is zero but if m is less than one then it is infinity when u is zero so it is super diffusive so let me just uh, review um, a bit what happens in the in the, in the porous medium case and in the heat equation case well when m is greater than one we call this porous medium, uh, well, this, this is the famous classical porous medium equation, and it's uh, the paradigm of slow diffusion, and it uh, has the, 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 the property of finite speed of propagation. When m is equal to one, it is the standard uh, it equation that you can find in the PDE books, and uh, we, will, we will see in a while what happens there. Just uh, <clears throat> and then when m is between zero and one, we are in the first, diffusion regime and the diffusion is so fast that the solution extinguish in finite time while in these two cases mass is preserved and uh, mm, mass is preserved and um, there is no extinction in finite time solution are positive non negative data produced solution which are positive for all uh, for all times. Then there is a, a case in which m is less or equal than zero, which is called ultra fast diffusion regime. And in this case, the asymptotic or let's say the, the situation is quite clear because solution do not exist. And this is a result of uh, baskets of 1991. Okay, so let me start by reviewing what is known in the case of the heat equation and in the porous medium case as an introduction of what happens in the more complicated situation in which, which is the fast diffusion regime. Hmm. So, well, when we deal with the classical uh, heat equation, um, when we deal with the classical heat equation, Fourier analysis helps a lot, indeed. What you can do, you take a non negative initial data, you take the eigen elements of the Dirichlet Laplacian. Hmm? So, uh, lambda k is a sequence of eigen, <coughs> eigenvalues that goes to plus infinity, if k are the corresponding eigenfunction. And then, using spectral analysis, you can write a formula for the solution in terms of the Fourier series. No? And, um, and this is uh, the, the explicit formula for the solution. Uh, 
and uh, U0K are the projection over the case uh, eigenspace. No? Well, from the above formula then, it's quite simple to deduce or to see the which is the asymptotic behavior. Indeed, it's not difficult to see that this is true. And this is true in LP for LP, basically for LP between one and plus infinity. Well, actually, we can do better. And do better it means uh, instead of the plane convergence, we can ask for convergence in relative error. What does it mean, convergence in relative error? It means that the quotient between you and the stationary solution or the asymptotic profile uh, properly scaled, the quotient tends to one. Why this is stronger? Well, because remember, we are dealing with the Dirichlet problem. And so both u and phi one in this case are zero at the boundary. So we are saying that the convergence is uniform and the uniformity is kept until uh, up to the boundary. Okay, then here what you can do, uh, you just collect these, uh, these two terms outside the series and you have just to make sure that this is convert, uh, that this is finite. And this is finite because basically all the, the eigenfun uh, all the other eigenfunction in absolute value behave at the boundary like phi one. So this is always uh, bounded by some constants, okay? So what are the essential ingredients here? The essential ingredients here are um, the, the second spectral gap. I mean, you need really a second spectral gap here in order to get a, an extra decay. And then the boundary behavior of the eigenfunction is already said, we need to show this. So this is, a sharp result, but it relies on the representation formula on Fourier and spectral analysis. Analogously, you can treat more general linear operator than the Laplacian. They are essentially any operator which has a discrete set of eigenelements would do, would work essentially in the same way. We will see our linearized operator, how it behaves in detail later on. Okay, so this is a summary for what happens in the case m equal one for the classical lit equation. But unfortunately, in the nonlinear case, we don't have Fourier analysis. What do we do? So let me explain uh, what, what is done in the case of the porous medium equation. So now the equation is ut equal Laplace, Laplace u to the m, m greater than one, porous medium equation. So the asymptotic behavior, I mean, here the story is, um, <laughs> is, um, is a bit more, um, I just sketch some main point in order to understand the strategy in the fast diffusion case. So you have an asymptotic profile, which is given by the so-called friendly giant. What is the friendly giant is basically the biggest solution you can find in this case. So it's a solution we start from the initial data plus infinity, and it has this form. It is by separation of variable, and there is the spatial part S, which, uh, which solves this elliptic equation. Hmm? Dirichlet problem for this elliptic equation, zero at the boundary, which is semi-linear. Hmm? And then it, there is the, 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 the time part, which is given by the corresponding ODE. Here, the constant C is just one divided by a minus one. It's a positive constant. We don't really care about it. So what is convenient to do in this, um, in this, uh, in this setting is, OK, here you have the, the, the the solution by separation of variable, which represent the asymptotic behavior, or we guess that it represents the asymptotic behavior of all the other solutions. So what do we do? We make it stationary because here we, we, we would like the, 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 the asymptotic profile to be just dependent on X. So what do we do? We just multiply U by this factor. You scale this factor out of u. You define w like this, and you take a logarithmic time scale in order to see what happened in, in slow motion, and in order to be able to get some, um, as, uh, some rates of decay of the solution towards the asymptotic states. What does it what does it change this in the, in the equation? It, it changes just that uh, the equation stays like the porous medium equation, but then this logarithmic term makes appear this factor C, which is exactly this constant, times W. So there is a source term. This source, source term is okay here since M is bigger than one, so there is doesn't cause uh, a blow up. And um, okay, solution now, <coughs> are um, monoton monotonically converging to S of X. And uh, mm, in this language, uh, U 
that the solution by separ separation of variable in this setting now is stationary, which means that solves this part of the equation, dt of w is zero, it solves this part of the equation or equivalently this elliptic problem. So the result that you can prove is relative error convergence, which means that the quotient between W, the rescale solution, and the stationary solution, minus one in L infinity, is less or equal than E to the minus T. Yeah, remember that we are in, under the logarithmic rescaling. And the constant one in front of the T is sharp. In original variable, this means the following. This means that the quotient between U and the, and the friendly giant, the solution by separation of variable, minus one, is less than some constants, and you see the rate of decay is one over tau. And this is again sharp because, um, um, because you see, you, if you take another solution, which is not the friendly giant, but just the friendly giant translated in time. So if you take the solution which begins with the, with the stationary state, then, okay, it is easy to check. You just make a simple computation that d is minus the friendly giant has exactly this rate of decay. Uh, what do you pay for other solution? For other solution, you pay that to enter the asymptotic regime, you have to wait some time t0, which is proportional to this um, weighted norm of the initial data. Okay, so uh, this result was first obtained by Aronson and Pelletier in 1981, and then generalized by Vasquez in 2004 in a very nice, uh, in a very nice paper, which also surveys different method to get the same result. We improved a bit, or we gave dif different proof uh, in a series of paper in collaboration with uh, Alex Figali, Yannick Sir, and Juan Luis Vasquez, in which we were more interested in the local version of porous medium equation, but in particular the method developed there also applied to the classical case in which you recover the known result and an alternative proof. Okay, this is um, uh, what happens in the case m greater or equal than one. Now uh, we know that when m is less than zero there, there are no solutions, so now we have completed all the cases but m between zero and one, which is what we are going to uh, to talk about uh, from now on. So now we concentrate on the real uh, problem that we want to solve. So uh, let me recall first uh, some properties of solution to the fast diffusion equation when m is between zero and one to emphasize why uh, it is more complicated and which are the difficulties that appear at the very first step. So first, you would like to have bounded solution, right? And uh, well, when M is very close to zero, you have to ask an eigen integrability of the initial data. Otherwise, you don't have a uh, bounded solution. This is uh, well known since uh, I think a famous counterexample of Brezis and Friedman. Uh, but you can look at the, uh, the, the, the nice uh, lecture notes of Juan Luis uh, Vasquez. Um, about smoothing effect and properties of uh, fast diffusion equation to, 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 to see that the uh, solution needs, um, that initial data needs to be in uh, a certain uh, sufficiently high LP space in order to produce bounded solution. Then another difficulty is that the mass is not preserved along the evolution. So solution always extinguish in finite time. So there exists a time capital T, which depends on the initial data, such that U is identically zero for all time later than this capital T. And this is a consequence, for example, of Sobolev and Poincaré inequalities, which both hold in the in bounded domain with zero boundary data. <clears throat> also, solutions, when uh, the initial data is non-negative, solution become instantaneously positive. And this is a consequence of parabolic uh, intrinsic Karnak inequality for singular equation, which were proved by uh, Di Benedetto, Gianazza, Kwong, and Vespri in a series of papers starting from 91 until uh, 2012. And uh, in the, in the so-called problem, for example, you preserve mass. Here in the, in the bounded domain, you never preserve mass. Uh, while uh, uh, in, the, in the very fast diffusion regime, it was a paper of myself and uh, Juan Luis in 2010. So once they are positive, once they are bounded, as it happens often in parabolic theory, 
the, 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 the solutions are regular. Indeed, there is this beautiful paper of the Benedetto, Kong and Vespri in 1991, in which they show that solutions are regular up to the boundary, and they are also smooth, see infinity smooth, while well, even analytic in the interior. So we have seen that solutions exist, they are positive, they are bounded, and they are regular. So classical solution. And uh, the question now is what happens close to the extinction time? So what is the profile of extinction? Can we know something about the extinction profile of these solutions. Okay, so this is the question that we will address in the rest of the talk. So, uh, the first thing that we do is, as, in the, as it has been done for the porous medium equation, we rescale the problem and uh, to try to, to, to get the, the stationary solution. Here, the first difficulty arises because you see, these solutions, uh, this solution to this problem extinguishing finite time, which is capital T, which is this one. And this complicates everything because you have to rescale in order to put the interval zero T into zero plus infinity, but you want to keep the initial data. Hmm? So keeping the initial data means that you pay here the fact that the constant that it appears here depends on uh, capital T. And remember that capital T was dependent on the initial datum. So where is the information about the initial datum here? The initial date, the information about the initial datum here is containing the constant C apart from the initial time. So once you rescale in this way, you pass from this equation to a formally, uh, to an equation which looks formally the same as, as the case M greater or equal than one, but the constant C is different. Of course, the asymptotic behavior now is, can be seen or can be characterized uh, in terms of uh, the uh, solution to the stationary problem, which again looks the same, but remember that now this constant C really depends on the uh, initial time, which unfortunately is not explicit. So this is something that we know how to estimate sharply from above and from below, but there is not an explicit expression, not to the best of my knowledge. So we built this solution of separation of variables, which played an analogous role of the friendly giant as before, but they are no more the biggest one, as we will see in a while. But <clears throat> then we rescale the equation such that this solution by separation of variable, which represent the behavior close to extinction, became stationary. Hmm? Here, a crucial exponent naturally arises. I mean, this problem is solvable only when m is bigger than this. I will rephrase this problem in a more, um, in, a, in a, with, a, with a slight change of variable. This is a semi-linear elliptic equation of Laplace u equal u to the p and um, with p greater than one. So this is the analogous of the Sobolev exponent. Hmm? Then let me see what were the previous result about uh, the uh, asymptotic behavior of, uh, the, of the fuzzy fusion equation in, uh, 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 for the initial problem of the fuzzy fusion equation. The first pioneering result was done by Berryman and Holland in the 80s, and it, it states the following. You take a bounded solution to the rescale problem no, uh, in this range of uh, uh, parameters. Then for every sequence of time Tn that goes to infinity, there exists a stationary solution such that omega Tn converges to uh, S in the natural H1 topology. Hmm. Well, this seems nice and it is nice because it's a, it's a first result and it, um, but as they, the, the, the authors were uh, saying in their article, there are some problems. First, the set of stationary solution, unlike the other cases, the set of stationary non-negative stationary solution is not made by one element. So in general, stationary solution are not unique. So different sequences can converge to different solutions. So how do we do? Well, it took a while to, to, to show that uh, the parabolic uniqueness, I mean, you start from an initial data, you get a unique parabolic solution, but that the solution a priori is allowed to oscillate when t goes to infinity among different stationary states. Huh? 
This was the first result. But then in the, in, in the year 2000, Fires and Simondon, by using Loyasevic's technique la Leon Simon, showed that in spite of the fact that there can be many stationary states, well, the bounded solution, which means the, 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 the initial data, selects only one stationary solution towards, uh, towards um, uh, which W converges, okay? So here there is what we call the uniqueness of the asymptotic profile. So this first difficulty what was overcome 20 years later. Uh, then, uh, what, once you converge uniformly, to, once you know that the convergence is uniform uh, towards the stationary solution, one can ask, what about the convergence in relative error? And, uh, <coughs> and um, well, the convergence in relative error is true, again, so let W be a solution corresponding to an initial data or a bounded solution, then there exists a unique S such that W converges to S, and then under this assumption, and this S is, is predicted by the theorem of Firesel and Simondon, then the quotient also converges uniformly to one. Okay? And this is uh, the, the version in original variable, this is the version in rescaled variable. Okay? So, what does this mean? What does this mean? This means that you have what we call an improved global ARNA principle. What does the global ARNA principle tell you? The global ARNA principle tells you that the solution to your problem behaves like a certain function of time times a certain function of space. S of X is the stationary solution, which uh, it's standard elliptic theory, behaves like the distance to the power one over M. Here, why we call improved global ARNA principle? Because the global ARNA principle uh, has proved by, has firstly proved by the Benedetto Quang and Vespri in 1991, says that there exists a constant below and a constant above such that this is true. Here we show why this is why it's improved that you can choose C depending on tau and converges, uh, converging to one as tau tend to capital T. Then this is, um, just a way of rephrasing the uniform convergence in relative error, okay? So this is uh, the improved uh, global ARNA principle. And then the next question is, can we get some rates of convergence of this? Because this is plain convergence. I mean, we just know that C of T is going to one. But we would like to be able to say that this decays as a certain function of tau or of T, in rescale, better in T, rescaled variable, okay? So this is the, the question, and the answer came in, 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 this, in this paper uh, that uh, we finished with Alessio uh, one year and a half ago, and uh, is going to appear soon, which is the following. First, let's, uh, let's consider the, 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 the set O of the open, uh, open, connected, and compact uh, set with smooth boundary, subset of Rn with, the sub, uh, with smooth boundary. Hmm? With a certain topology, we will come back uh, later to this. So, what we say is that there exists a, a set of good domains huh, such that the following holds. We will turn out, I will try to explain this G, which stands for good or generic domain, no? which is the title of the talk and we devote the rest of the of the talk to explain this and to explain the rest of the of the result which is the following you take the bounded solution with its stationary unique stationary state such that this convergence is true then you can find a lambda m and a constant such that this quantity so basically the L2 weighted norm of the relative error decays in this precise way. So lambda, this uh, rate of decay is sharp. I will tell you what is lambda later and I will explain you why it is sharp, okay? So um, we can also get as a corollary of this plus some regularity estimates that the uniform relative error decays in this fashion. Notice that the power here for n is just because we use some regularity estimate. We don't believe this for n is sharp. Anyways, lambda m here is sharp. Okay, then what happens in the original variable? Well, in the original variable, you can rephrase the same result as follows. In here, you see that you gain before with the, 
and here you see that you gain a certain decay rate, which is better seen here. Before we were only able to see that this to say that this quantity goes to zero. Here we are able to say that this quantity goes to zero precisely like this. Hmm? Notice that when m was close to one, um, we gave in 2012 with the uh, Grill and <coughs> with Gabriele Grill and Juan Luis Vasquez. We gave uh, some rates of convergence when M is very close to one by using a, 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 an entropy method based on some continuity with respect to M of the equation. Mm -hmm. However, this expression, even if it was explicit, this M, M sharp was like depending on the constant of the elliptic Karnak inequalities is really, really complicated and absolutely didn't cover the whole range. But they were, this was the first result about no sharp rate, but still rates. Okay, so uh, in some sense, we have improved these in many, in many, many directions. Okay, so for the rest of the talk, I will try to explain why lambda m is, uh, is sharp and what does it mean for uh, a generic domain. Okay, the idea when I asked, uh, when, when we were writing these, no, we said, okay, but what does it mean to be a generic domain. Basically, the idea is that any domain that you can draw, draw by hand, will do. Because um, uh, actually, if a domain does not enter in these, then you can perturb it slight, uh, just a little bit around the, 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 the boundary, for example, and then it will be an admissible domain or a good domain for the, this result to work. I will make this, uh, more precisely. So for the rest of the talk now, we change from this notation to this notation. What does it mean? We take the function V to be W to the M, the function capital V to be the stationary solution to the M, and we call P one over M, which is strictly bigger than one. So you change from this equation to this equation, the initial data change in the obvious way, and of course, also the boundary, the boundary values are preserved as far as the same happens for the the same happens for the for the stationary equation. Here there is a minus missing. Sorry, and um, <clears throat> and also for the range of m. The range of m was this m slightly less than this quantity, which amounts which amounts to uh, to us that p is super linear but below the critical Sobolev exponent. And this is more familiar to the people working in elliptic equation. Why do we do uh, this restriction? Because uh, when P is bigger or equal than this one, uh, solutions, uh, bounded solution to this problem fail to exist. Uh, then, what do we need for our uh, entropy method? For the rest of the proof, we need to use assumption H1 delta, which we call H1 delta. What does it mean? It means basically that uniform convergence in relative error. It means that V minus V behaves like delta times capital V. This means if you divide by V that the relative error is small for all uh, times starting from a certain T0. Hmm? This is always true since we know the convergence in relative error, okay? So, um, then let me quickly recall the properties of stationary solutions. The property of stationary solution are the following. I mean, this is the standard semilinear elliptic equation in, the, in this range of exponent. Omega is a regular domain, so existence is guaranteed uh, in all the exponent range. By standard calculus operation technique, you can look, for example, the book of uh, Michael Struve, which is talking later. Uh, boundedness again is guaranteed by the Georgi Nash Moser technique, and absolute bounds have been proven by Gidas and Sprague in the Figueredo Lyons to bound in the 80s in dif for different classes of domain. And then, okay, of course, uh, non negative solutions are positive inside and uh, they behave like the distance to the boundary. Then the regularity, while well, solutions are classical in the interior, even C infinity. The problem is uniqueness. So uniqueness depends on the geometry of the domain. For example, it holds on ball, but it does not on annually. It does not hold on annually. For example, you have the radial solution on annually, but then you have a, a, a solution which breaks the symmetry. And then since the operator is, um, 
is a translation invariant. Once you have one which is non radial, then you have infinitely many. And it's really difficult to, 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 to study the set of solutions in this case. Then, uh, several conditions uh, for uniqueness are present in the literature. It is hopeless to give a complete account of uh, the literature about this semilinear elliptic problem. Uh, I'm sorry if I forgot to mention important contributions. Uh, so, what do we do? Well, we take our nonlinear equation and we linearize it. We linearize it around the stationary state. So, formally, we run these ansatz and we end up with this linear parabolic equation. So, first, we note uh, that uh, uh, V, our, candid, uh, our uh, asymptotic profile, is not a stationary solution of the linearized equation because it doesn't make this zero because it's a solution with constant c, not with constant c p. Remember that p is strictly greater than one. So the idea is, then the natural question that arises, is which are the stationary states of this equation? Well, they are the solution of this elliptic problem, the Dirichlet problem associated to this equation. And well, understanding, of course, zero is a solution, but understanding whether or not there are trivial non-trivial solution to this problem is really uh, a difficult task. No? So first, let's study the spectrum of this operator and then we will see. So this is um, uh, the Laplacian on, on this weighted spade. I mean, we, we decided to treat this as if it was a, as it is a bounded potential. And so we, we have to study the spectrum of the Laplacian on this weighted space, which I denote just by L2V instead of L2V. 2VP minus 1. It's a, it's a weighted L2 norm with this weight. Okay? From now on, it will be always the same. So, the minus Laplacian works very well. It has a discrete set of uh, eigen, uh, of eigen uh, values and a discrete set of eigenfunction. And the projection on the eigenspaces is denoted by PVK. Uh, and um, you can see all the spectral uh, information uh, resumed in this slide. And finally, we just note that we know what is the first eigenvalue, which is C, exactly the constant C. Remember, it depends on the initial data. And, um, and then the first, eigen, the first normalized eigenfunction is exactly our stationary profile V. So the rest of uh, eigenfunctions are smooth up to the boundary and they satisfy the estimate that we need to satisfy. So the, the boundary behavior of the absolute value, they can change, they, say, they change sign, of course, is less or equal to this. So they behave like the distance to the power one. So let me show you the idea of our nonlinear entropy method in uh, um, uh, first by doing, uh, seeing what happens in the linear. Case. The linear case, you take the, remember, this is the equation, you take the L2 norm, the L2 weighted norm, you derive it along the flow, and you obtain this. And this is what is usually called the Fisher information or the linear entropy production. And it is the gradient square minus this. In order to close the functional, uh, to close the differential inequality and to get exponential decay, you need a Poincare inequality, but you need an improved Poincare inequality because you see here you have a kind of P which is bigger than the first eigen, the, the first PC is bigger than the first eigen value, which is C. So you need an improved Poincare inequality which requires suitable orthogonality conditions. So once you use the Poincare inequality, then you close the differential inequality, you have this simple ODE which integrates gives you this. Okay? So the problem is that to prove the improved Poincare inequality, we need some extra condition. The first condition that we need, it is this condition H2, which, which is there is no non-trivial solution to this, uh, to this problem. So many, many, the only solution is phi equal zero, identically equal to zero. Well, uh, this is um, an assumption that we will, we will see when it holds and when it doesn't. But what, why we do we need this assumption? Because under this assumption, uh, we are sure that CP or PC is not an eigenvalue, so it is trapped between two different eigenvalues. So it denotes by KP the number that such that this is true. And then uh, by prescribing suitable orthogonality condition, I mean killing all the pre all the lower modes, here you get 
and improved Poincare inequality, which does the job here and gets you the exponential decay problem. The orthogonality condition are preserved or not along the linear flow. Yes, they are. You can do this computation. You derive the projections and you discover that you have this equality, which integrated gives you this. So what does this mean? It is means that unless you prescribe the, the initial, the, the initial, um, the initial datum satisfy the orthogonality condition, or the projection will eventually blow up at, at uh, t plus equal plus infinity in an exponential way. So either these are zero or they blow up. And this is, um, this is something that, uh, okay, in the linear case, it's easy to solve. You prescribe an orthogonality condition on the initial datum, and then you have the improved Poincaré because it's preserved along the flow. You have improved Poincaré, you can go back and you can uh, integrate this differential inequality and get the sharp exponential decay, which is what we wanted at the beginning. Okay, this is, uh, this is the, the, the strategy in the linear case. What do we do in the nonlinear case? Well, in the nonlinear case, first we have to choose uh, to see when, well, before that, we have to, to see when the assumption H2 is generically, uh, when the assumption H2 is true. Well, the assumption is true is means that this equation just have the trivial solution, or equivalently that CP does not belong, is not an eigenvalue. Hmm? Well, this is not e so easy to check, but it happens to be generically true. What does it mean? You take this set, the set of, of all the open, uh, compact, uh, relatively compact domains with smooth boundary of Rn. And you put a topology, which is the C2 alpha convergence of domains. So you allow for C2 alpha perturbation of these domains. And um, well, you define the set of good sets. Hmm? The good sets are the one for which our assumption is true. Hmm? So CP doesn't belong to the spectrum. Well, it turns out that South and Temam in, in 1979 uh, showed that the, the set G of good, of, good, um, of good domains is open and dense in, uh, with, with respect to the topology of, of this bigger, bigger set. So what does it mean that almost, that, that the, the, the almost all domain or a generic domain, one that I can draw by, by hand and so on, all of these are really good domains for our method to work and this is true. Well, let's see some example. Well, of course, this is true on balls of Rn. In dimension two, there are some results of Denser, Damascelli, Grossi, Pacella, which says that it holds, the, Condi this condition holds on, um, on domains which are convex in some direction and symmetric with respect to hyperplane and so on. Then it holds, so proved, uh, proved that it, uh, these things hold on C1 perturbation of ball. And for the anomaly, the result is not true, but we can perturb a, a little bit, even only the boundary of, 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 of the domain. And then the, the hypothesis H2 turns out to be true. Um, when also when P is very close to one, we know that these quantities converge, uh, converge to the first uh, spectral gap of the standard Laplacian, hence we are again in game. There are several examples of cases in which uh, this assumption is true. And uh, let me in the last, uh, in the last five minutes, try to uh, explain to you what are the main ingredients in the nonlinear entropy method. Well, the nonlinear entropy method starts from you have the convergence in relative error, you write this entropy that when you see it like this, it seems really innocent, it is the integral of a convex function, but it is not the standard one and it took us quite a while and a lot of intents to uh, find the right one. What does it mean, the right one? First, it has to be comparable with the linear one. In the asymptotic regime, he, uh, when the um, convergence in relative error is true, the nonlinear entropy has to be uh, quantitatively comparable with the L2 norm or the linear entropy mm -hmm. squared. But the difficult part, and this happens whenever basically you put a, a convex function here, but the difficult part is here. When you do the entropy production, I mean you derive the entropy along the flow, then you get 
uh, you get several terms. And only with this entropy we were able to find this beautiful, uh, this beautiful formula, which says that the derivative of the entropy is minus the linear uh, Fisher information, so the gradient basically, uh, plus a certain reminder, which is cubic. And this is really the, the this is really a point in uh, we, we need it to be cubic if you choose a different entropies here we got just a quadratic reminder and we were not able to conclude our argument but then we have to check we, we, we needed to check the orthogonality condition so how do you prescribe orthogonality condition along a nonlinear flow they tend not to be um, to be fulfilled I mean, it's not said that the orthogonality condition, even if you impose it on the initial data, is true along the nonlinear flow. So we define this kind of uh, really, uh, real, no, linear Rayleigh quotient, which are the projection over the eigenfunction divided by the entropy. And we say that the function is almost orthogonal if these quotients are small. Okay? Well, we also define nonlinear Rayleigh quotient type, so you see nonlinear projection, some kind of nonlinear projection divided by the nonlinear entropy. The analogy is really strong. And we define an almost orthogonality condition, let's say nonlinear. Okay, good. Then what does it happen? Uh, well, a few pages of computation shows that uh, you can compare quantitatively the nonlinear and the linear quotients so that these conditions are essentially equivalent up to changing a bit the, the constant, okay? So when I say um, that solutions are almost orthogonal, I mean in the linear or in the nonlinear sense, it doesn't really matter. So what happens? Then next step is to prove a better Poincare inequality for the almost orthogonal function. And this is what we do, you see? If you have the almost orthogonality condition, uh, which fixes the epsilon, then you have an improved Poincare and you lose just this epsilon square here. This is what you lose for the, um, this is the price you pay, the price you pay. And then this automatically helps to improve the entropy and the production inequality because you see now you, we have the relative error H1 is delta, is this delta is small. Then you have the almost orthogonality. And so you see you have the rate that you want. This is what be the sharp rate. And then you lose a bit. You lose a bit, but uh, this, is, um, this is good already because here you're, we already have exponential decay, even if not sharp, but almost. Then what do you do? Well, if you can control better, if you can control better the, uh, the relative error in terms of the entropy, and if the also the almost orthogonality is relatively small, but quantitatively controlled by the entropy, then we have a lot better. You see, you, we, we can arrive to this differential uh, inequality, which says, okay, this is the linear part, which is good, which tells you the exponential decay, and then you have this uh, nonlinear part, which has a delay also. But, uh, well, after some tries, we were able to find a super solution to this ODE with delays, which is given by this, and it has the right exponential decay, you see? so. Whenever we arrive here, we have the desired optimal rate, okay? So what do we have to guarantee? And then I'm almost done. I will need to, a couple of minutes more. What do we need? We need H1 delta and H2 to be guaranteed. And these two assumptions to be guaranteed to get the, 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 sharp, uh, the sharp estimate. So what do we do? We observe that as in the linear case, when the um, when the, the relay quotient are relatively big, then they tend to blow up in uh, in exp uh, in an exponential way in infinite time. And this is as in the linear case, no. And this is the most delicate part of the of the proof. This is really uh, a difficult a difficult point in which uh, really Alessio did the magic. And um, and um, then we can uh, prove the surprising fact, which is the following, that the, the almost orthogonality along the nonlinear flow actually gets better. Well, let's say, let's, let me just compare linear versus nonlinear. In the linear flow, either you impose the orthogonality condition at the beginning and you have it for all times, or it is false and the projection blow up. Here, we discover that having 
having the uh, convergence in relative errors allow you to prove that there is this almost orthogonality, there is all the almost orthogonality that you need in order to run the method. Not only, you have only also quantitative almost orthogonality along the nonlinear flow. So the almost orthogonality is free, guaranteed, is, is, is implied by just the, um, it's just implied by the convergence, uniform convergence relative error. Then this is really the, the, the last slide. Then we have to see that you can control the L infinity norm of the relative error by the entropy to some even small power, but to, for, to, from the entropy to some power. And this is another chapter. I mean, this is a smoothing effect, which is the following. You can prove these estimates, which are basically L2, L infinity estimates for the relative error, which imply the desired control that we wanted, which is this one, and ensures that all the assumptions that we needed in order the method to work are guaranteed. And uh, this is the end of the talk. Thank you very much uh, for your attention.